Well, thanks everyone. I'm super excited to be here and honored. It's my first ever Marine GIS uh, user group conference. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because I feel like I'm a bit of an outsider surrounded by so many people with PhDs in ecology and marine science. So bear with me. Um, but I did want to start off by showing what I think most people probably think of when they hear the word Monterey Bay. Sea otters, sea kelp, healthy ecosystem, species distribution models. Um, but the company that I work for, Second Nature, this is what we typically think about. Stormwater and stormwater management. <laughs> So stormwater management is the effort to reduce rainfall runoff from our impervious surfaces within our cities. And as we've seen in the last few years, and especially this last winter here um, in Santa Cruz and Monterey, um, it's getting increasingly more apparent for stormwater management, and we need to have better ways to manage our urban areas and reduce runoff and flooding events like we've seen in Pajaro just a few months ago. But unfortunately, urban development and flooding don't seem to get along all the time. <laughs> Natural areas are, and forested areas, are actually pretty good at reducing runoff. So when it rains a lot, um, the soil allows uh, water to infiltrate back into groundwater aquifers. But when you start to pave over those natural areas, you know, you create things like pipes and concrete lined channels like the LA River um, and parking lots. You lose that ability to infiltrate water. Um, and so we end up as humans creating these flashy, heavy floods, um, a lot like, again, we've seen in, in Monterey. And when you combine that with climate change and more frequent and more intense rainstorms, you get some of these very detrimental flooding events. And this is why stormwater management is so important. And a lot of people don't really think twice about, you know, what happens to our, our water when it rains. And it turns out that open data, open science, and GIS is critical for thinking and also communicating about stormwater. So today I'm going to talk about how the company I work for, Second Nature, developed an urban runoff model using GIS and open data to quantify the stormwater runoff potential for the entire United States. And I'll go through some use cases of the model, the results, um, and talk about how some of our clients today are using the outputs to better plan for stormwater infrastructure projects in their cities. But first, a little bit about Second Nature. We are a team of about 30 software engineers, scientists, hydrologists, GIS analysts, and we're based across the United States. Um, but we started here and found, we're founded here in Santa Cruz and in Seabright. Um, and we build stormwater software. And I'll explain a little bit more what that means in a little bit. Um, and all of our clients are local government. So think of cities, counties, um, flood departments, and stormwater departments. City of Santa Cruz and uh, City of Monterey are actually one of our first early adopters. And our product, our software product, helps our clients meet water quality regulatory requirements. So think anything related to the Clean Water Act. And our software also helps them to plan and implement future stormwater projects. So think of green infrastructure or flood reduction um, and also helps them quantify the effectiveness of their stormwater program, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And although Second Nature is a for-profit company, <laughs> I know this is about open data, we can't do what we do at my company without GIS and without open science and open data. Okay, so now back to the problem that we were trying to solve. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, stormwater professionals are technically, they're usually relied, relied upon engineering uh, rainfall runoff models to better understand um, the impact 
that storms and rain events have on their cities and their neighborhoods. But these engineering models can be um, very complex and computationally heavy. And typically these models are used for when you're designing a new parking lot or a new housing development, it needs to be very, very accurate. Um, and these models historically require continuous rainfall simulations. So think of rainfall measurements every 15 minutes or every day. So it's a lot of data. Plus, if they want to run the models, requires site-specific data. And it needs to be calibrated just to be able to estimate uh, rainfall runoff volumes and pollution concentrations. So all in all, the data can be very hard to find. Um, it takes a lot of time to compile or generate if you need to. And then once that data is finally compiled, um, these models can take a really long time to run. Again, because we're using these continuous rainfall simulations, it's going to use a lot of memory on your computer and take time to actually run on your machine. So if you want to play around with scenarios or change inputs, it's going to be time intensive and, and take a lot of time. But if we go back to the end user of these models, it's a stormwater manager working for a city. So they're not going to be a modeling specialist, nor do they need that super accurate esti estimate of runoff. <laughs> And what they're really concerned about is understanding patterns within their cities. They want to know what areas or neighborhoods are um, flood prone or which areas have the highest potential for pollution, you know, due to streets or nearby agriculture. Um, and so they needed a model that would be fit for their purpose and something that would be easier and more lightweight to run. So we at Second Nature developed a new modeling methodology. And with this method, we had three main goals. So one was that we wanted it to be spatially explicit. And what I mean by that is these traditional engineering models um, used tabular data, even though the inputs were inherently spatial. So think of data like soils or impervious surfaces or land use. Those are inherently spatial. We can have maps with that. But what was happening is that we were losing that resolution because it was tabular and we had to summarize it by watershed or by a region. So with our model, we wanted to be able to leverage the spatial re resolution of that data because that mattered for the city. The second is that we needed this model to be adaptable meaning that it's responsive to new inputs. Um, think of climate change scenarios. It's a real thing. And cities have you know, these 20, 30 year master plans. We need to understand where in the city is it going to flood in 20 years. So we wanted to be able to um, build it in a way that we could easily change around the inputs. We also wanted to do that to play around again with different scenarios. What if they put a flood basin here, or they um, revamp the downtown to have green streets over here. What would that look like? And then lastly, this model needed to be fast to run for um, a variety of different reasons. One was that it was essential if we wanted to include this into our software product. We wanted to be able to run this model on the web and allow our clients to use it. So it had to be something that you click a button, couple minutes go by, you get your modeled outputs. Um, also, having a robust model like this to run fast meant that we can run a lot of those scenarios and those iterations that I was talking about. Lastly, we also wanted to be able to easily run this model for the entire United States, which was no easy feat. <laughs> These models are typically run on like a very small site scale. Um, but allowing us to run it for the entire United States would allow us as a company to reach potential clients across the whole country and also have a better understanding of what the opportunity that our country has at managing stormwater, which has never really been something that was published or done before. 
So after a lot of research and looking online at open data sets, um, we ended up utilizing four main data sets that are nationwide. So the first one was a rainfall data set from the PRISM Climate Group up in uh, Oregon State. And they have a really cool data product where they have these raster data sets of daily rainfall for the last, I don't know, 50 years. Um, and there are these raster data sets on a four kilometer scale, which is pretty, um, pretty fine resolution. So we chose that for our rainfall. Um, and then we also decided to go with the NLCD. They have um, lots of different data products. One of them is an impervious surfaces data set and a land cover data set um, that they produce from uh, Landsat imagery. And those are really great because they update them about every four years. So it's pretty up to date. Um, and then we, we took a soils data set from the USGS. Um, specifically hydrologic soil information to inform our runoff model. Um, and so those were our four main inputs to our model. But now that we had these four different layers, they're all different formats. Some of them were in vector shape files. Some of them were in raster, four kilometers versus 30 meters. So um, the resolution was uh, all different and we needed a way to easily line things up so we could run our calculations. And so the easiest way for us to do that was to put everything in a raster format. So we rasterized everything. And then we needed to decide on our resolution, like you were just mentioning. <laughs> and we played around with different resolutions, but ultimately ended up using the 30 by 30 meter resolution that the MLCD uses. Um, one, because it was a good spatial resolution for the purpose of the model. Again, we wanted to be able to see patterns across cities. So 30 meter resolution is pretty fine where you can get um, a good estimate across a pretty large city. So we rasterized everything. We resampled some of the rasters that we needed to. And now we have this, everything's lined up on 30 meter resolutions. And then basically what we did is run a bunch of raster calculations using a GIS model in the beginning and ultimately a Python script. Um, and we get this really cool output of a potential stormwater runoff for the entire United States, which looks something like this. <laughs> and after tons and tons of iterating and testing and QA, yeah, this is what we came up with. Um, it's a little hard to tell because it's the, the whole country, um, but basically these dark blue areas represent uh, areas that have higher rates of runoff. So that could be due to the four inputs I was talking about, um, rainfall patterns, soils, uh, the amount of impervious surfaces, et cetera, the combination of those. So we start to look and see patterns, um, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, it rains a lot versus, um, you know, Las Vegas, it doesn't get a lot of rain. So you get to see the patterns and kind of understand. And what you can't really tell on this map, again, though, is that this is a huge raster layer of 30 meter pixels. But because this is the Monterey Bay GIS group, I wanted to take a closer look at um, what the results look like for our area. And so from this model, we learned that the urban areas of Monterey County, and I think Santa Cruz County is included in this, um, generates around 14 million gallons per day of runoff annually. So again, this is a model. So it's not based on, um, well, it's based off of historical data, but it's not measured. But annually, on average, 14 million gallons per day of runoff runs off our streets into directly into the Monterey Bay. And if you overlay um, groundwater aquifers that we've mapped in the area on top of that, 50% of that runoff that's generated is directly atop a groundwater aquifer, which means that we have the potential to infiltrate about half of that water instead of shoving it out into the bay. 
So already a great use case on how we can use this information to advocate for more stormwater management and um, educate the, the public and our stakeholders. So I'm sure I just made that look super easy, <laughs> but like I said, this model was definitely no easy feat. Um, 30 meter rasters for the entire United States is a lot of data, takes a lot of memory and a lot of time to process everything. Um, so a few challenges. One of the challenges was around the rainfall data. So again, we extracted 35 years of daily rainfall from the PRISM climate group one layer for each day. So that's a lot, that's a lot of days. Um, but if we go back to one of the goals that we had is that we wanted this to be lightweight and fast to run. And so we decided to kind of swap that temporal resolution for a spatial one, again, because we wanted this to be like you could interact with the model outputs. So we needed to somehow aggregate the rainfall data so we're not using daily time steps. So what we did is we needed to calculate percentile events. So the 85th percentile rain, 95th percentile rain, et cetera. And we originally tried writing a script in R to do that, but I don't know, failed due to memory. I wonder why. <laughs> Um, and trying to play around with other ways on how we could do this. And we ultimately ended up using Google Earth Engine, which is a very powerful tool. It leverages cloud computing. You can use it in academia. Um, so we're able to load in our rainfall data sets in there and run our scripts there. Additionally, as we started QAing all of the results, one thing that we noticed is that there gaps in our soils layer and also in our impervious layers um, and these really large metropolitan areas. So here's an example of Chicago. Um, and we didn't want to have these gaps mainly because this model was designed for urban stormwater runoff and urban stormwater managers. And so having gaps in these large areas wasn't going to cut it. <laughs> So we went back to the drawing board and originally we had used the USGS um, Sergo layer, if anyone's familiar, which is a pretty fine resolution. Um, we ended up having to kind of combine a lot of soils layers from the USGS and then we still had some gaps. So we used some raster calculations, nearest neighbors, getting averages to kind of fill in the gaps and at least get an estimate of what we thought was happening in these areas. And then lastly, um, so we had <laughs> rainfall processing issues, data gaps. And then lastly, once we actually ran this model um, on, our, on our computer, we didn't have a great way to share it for internally for QA purposes or externally to share with our clients, um, just again, because of the sheer size. So we played around with some options. Um, I believe we used GeoServer, which is an open source um, application. And we also are using image services in ArcGIS online with a process called mosaicing, where we basically kind of separate the different rasters and then uh, thread them together, which allows them to be accessed pretty quickly online. Um, so yeah lots of issues when you're dealing with a huge data set. All right, so besides a really cool looking map of the US, which I love looking at, um, what are some actual use cases of these model outputs? So for one, our clients are using these model outputs as a reconnaissance. And what's great about having a raster data set and having it at a 30 meter resolution is that you can summarize the results by any area of interest that you want. And so because we're dealing with water, a lot of what our clients care about is watersheds. So we're able to or aggregate rather the results by different watersheds within their cities and also different neighborhoods and then help them identify those priority watersheds and priority neighborhoods. So in the map here on the left, um, this is just a 
what if scenario, but it is actually in the city of Watsonville. Um, and we've summarized model results for the watershed that drains to the Pajaro River. And so the dark, darker areas here are those small watersheds that generate higher rates of runoff. So those might be good areas for the city to advocate for stormwater projects or um, flood reduction projects, things like that. But it's a very easy map and you have some results at the bottom where you can easily communicate that to um, your city staff or stakeholders. Additionally, our clients are also able to use the model as a way to quantify the effectiveness of their stormwater program. So all of the results that I've showed today are, are assuming that there's no uh, infrastructure in place or no best management practices already in place. But we know that that's not true. And a lot of cities have spent billions of dollars um, trying to reduce flooding and implementing stormwater infrastructure. So if we know where those assets are and where they're implementing practices, we can actually incorporate that in our model and then start to estimate what the reduction is. So quantify actually how much runoff we think that these cities are reducing based on the practices that they've implemented. And we can also take that one step further and incorporate what their existing infrastructure is, but then also play around with um, potential scenarios. So if there's a master plan and they maybe want to build green streets or a new flood basin, we can incorporate that in our model and estimate what we think their reduction is. So this map here on the right, it's the same Pajaro drainage, but now with some uh, planned and potential um, different stormwater practices and what we think our reduction is, which might be a little hard to see, but we're estimating a 30% reduction if they implement these practices. Oh. And then lastly, our clients are also able to um, use these maps and these data to, like I said, communicate to either city staff or the public on the importance of their stormwater program and um, maybe use it to advocate for higher budgets or grant funding. And one example of that is the city of Salinas. We've worked with the city of Salinas for probably seven years now. Um, and one of the projects that I really liked was working on this website, cleanwatersalinas.com. And the purpose of this website is really to help educate and raise awareness around Salinas' stormwater program. They have a very robust program. They're doing so much to help reduce pollution and runoff. And so we wanted to um, help communicate that better to, to the public. And so this is an example here where the map is a slider and you can see the impervious surfaces. And then when you slide it over, there's those watersheds that are colored by their relative runoff rates. So essentially the dark areas are those watersheds that generate higher rates of runoff. And those are neighborhoods where they would advocate for green infrastructure, flood reduction, things like that. So with that, I, was hope, I hope that I was able to enlighten some folks about the importance of stormwater management and how GIS and open data has been such a pivotal part of second nature. And um, yeah, I hope you all better understand the impacts that stormwater has on our communities. And if you want, you can take a photo of this QR code. It'll take you to a story map that explains a little bit more about the model that I was talking to today. And you can look at um, all of the results and estimates for all of California. And I'll open it to any questions. Is this a real real time tool or are you able to choose? Yeah, yeah. So the question is whether this is real time and if we can do future predictions. Is that right? Yeah, so this is not real time. So essentially what we've done is we've taken 
um, the impervious data set and land cover data sets that I think are from 2020. And then our rainfall is 35 years of historical rain events. So combine this together. So we're not using real time rain, um, but it is a good estimate of what we think would happen on an uh, annual basis. But what's really cool about that is we can swap the rainfall, right, to estimate um, what would happen in different climate change scenarios. Or we could do the same thing for impervious. So if a city is building a whole new neighborhood, we can use a different impervious layer and estimate what we think that, like how much runoff that new neighborhood would generate. So lots of different use cases there. Yeah. Have you guys done any work to like test your model, like measuring runoff after a certain event or things like that? Yeah, yeah. So question is um, if we've done any verification or testing and the answer is yes. Um, I didn't really go over it, but one of these slides this one has a publication. Okay. We've got a few publications on our methods, and one of them is we verified it in the Lake Tahoe Basin, and we're also doing um, monitoring and measuring in Salinas. So we're basically comparing it to the water that comes out of outfalls into their streams, and we find we've found like pretty close alignment, which is crazy. So yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> So green streets is essentially um, either making the surface pervious, so there's pervious pavers that you can get for parking lots, um, or it's directing, so of course, you know, cars have to drive on paved surfaces, but rather than directing the water directly to a storm drain and into the ocean, we can direct the water into um, what's called like bioswales that help re re-infiltrate that water. So that's essentially what green infrastructure is doing. It's trying to kind of replicate what natural areas already do, but in an urban setting. So it's not necessarily streets because it's more like parking lots because I'm, I, my understanding is like roadways can't really be those types. Exactly. Of yeah. Places. But you can direct the, the runoff yeah. from those streets into, yeah, like a bioswale. Yeah. yeah. 